Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody know what we're going to talk about? Or where we're going? We're going back to the start. Amen? Amen. It's good to see you all this morning. You have your Bibles? You can take those out or you can look at the screen, whatever your choice may be. We're going to be in Genesis this morning, taking that where Brother DJ left last week. Where he left off. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. It's going to be our scripture text this morning. The title of my message is going to be In His Image. Before I get into that this morning, I want to say if you're a guest here for the first time or if you're a guest here and you have not filled out a, a guest or a visitor card that's in front of you in the pew, please do that and leave it in the, in the pew as you go away today so we can track you down, hunt you down, do whatever it is we think we might want to do to you. So, uh, back in 1960, the month of September, my mom and dad went to the hospital uh, anxiously awaiting the birth of, of a son. Well, the son was born and they did all the things they had to do at the hospital and got all the, just, just got everything done they needed to do and I, they headed off home with their little son. Handsome little fella, I mean, they were just tickled to death. They get home, they come in the front door and they're waiting for mom and dad and that little boy was older sister, big sister. She was waiting to see that handsome, beautiful, wonderful little baby boy. Well, lo and behold, mom comes in and she pulls the blanket back and big sister looks at that little baby boy and instead of just being all excited and thrilled and just all over herself, she runs to her bedroom and breaks out crying. That poor little fella, she said, looked like a scrawny little bird. <laughs> she said he was purple and bony and that was all there was to it. That little fella still scrawny and looks like a bird today. It happens to be me. But anyway, uh, she had this image in her mind of what that little boy was going to look like. Kind of like you state fans had yesterday. You had this image. You were, you know, the game was so close. You know, you were sitting on the edge of your seat. You just knew that they were going to make that last basket. And they were going to beat Carolina. It just didn't happen, right? It's all about image this morning. It's what we want to talk about. We're going to talk about in man being made in the image of God. And to me, when we stop and think about that, isn't that just, kids would say it'd be the, it would be the coolest thing. We would say, I, I don't know, I'd say it'd be the neatest thing to think. That we are, man is made in the image of God. You and I, we're man. We're made in the image of God. That's what Scripture tells us in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Let's take a look at that this morning. God has done all this work, uh, light and dark, night and day, heaven and earth, dry land, seas, vegetation, moon, sun, birds, fish, and then, then what's left? It's, it's the creation of of man. In 26 and 27, this is what it said. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and, and let them rule over. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures, and move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, He created them. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we, as we journey in, into Your Word this morning and into this issue of the fact that we are made in Your image, Father, You know and I know that I don't understand half of what it is that You, that you know. And uh, I just pray right now that You'll be with us. You'll open our hearts and our minds. And as we look into this exciting and this wonderful fact that we are created in your image that you'll give us understanding of your word that we'll hear what's being said and we'll be able to take that away and tell it to a lost and dying world we ask these things in the name of jesus <coughs> amen as we think about the fact that we were created in his image the first thing that came to my mind is i did not evolve and you did not evolve you didn't come from a single cell or and eventually turn into an ape and then turn into a man. That just didn't happen. There's no way that I can accept that with what the Scriptures tell us. Another thing I want to point out to you is not just that we didn't evolve, but we were created. God created man. He created you and He created myself. And He created 
because when we say that we're created in the image of God, I don't know what you think about, but you can hear all these different ideas and all these different things about being created in God's image. Now, I believe because we're visually oriented people, when we talk about being created in the image of God, we're always trying to figure out where the body comes into that. You know, does God look like me? Does He look like you? Does He have a body? And all these different things. But I want to talk to you and share with you this morning that the Bible never says anything about God having a body. It says in John 4.24 that God is a spirit. And His worshipers must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we're, we're, we're created in His image according to His nature. Not according to the body. Quoting Adam Clark on this, he said this about God being a spirit. And that's being created in His image. And listen to what he says. I think it's worth, worth hearing. He says, this is one of the first, the greatest, the most sublime and necessary truths in the compass of nature. The fact that we're created in the image of God and the fact that there is a God. DJ did a wonderful job last week explaining that and just laying the groundwork for the fact that there is a God, hands down. No, you know, no other explanation do we need, but that there is a God. He's the cause of all things. The foundation of all perfection, without parts or, dim or dimensions, for He is eternal, filling the heavens and the earth, pervading, governing, and upholding all things, for He is an infinite Spirit. When you think about that, and you hear the greatness there, and you, all the things that He says about it, about the fact that God is an infinite Spirit, and then we think about the fact that we are made in His image how much different we are than all the other creation. So much different than the animal kingdom. So much different than anything else He created. Some, some, some commentators, some scholars say that man is the crown of creation. And I agree 100%. Man is the crown of creation when you look at all the other things. You ever stop and think about creation itself? About all the other things God created <coughs> other than man? I Googled this as I like to do uh, from time to time and just thought these things may be interesting to you. According to a New York Times article by Carl Zimmer, scientists estimate there to be 8.7 million species of animals. What do you think? You think there's that many? There's a lot, isn't there? Uh, an article in about.com says animals are estimated to be between 8,000 to 10,000 species just of the bird. Family. It's a lot, isn't it? Wise Geek says there are about 1,250,000 identified species of animals that exist today. Obviously, the numbers here are a little bit different depending on who you look at. Answers.com say, say 10 to 100 million, with 1.8 million having been given scientific names. What's, what's my point? What's their point? The greatness of God and His creation, when we think about all the animals, all the creatures, all the things He created. And then came the creation of man, the crown of creation, and the fact that we're created in His image. No bird, no fish, no land animal, nothing else is created in His image. Only man. We're created in the image of God. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel special. And it should make you feel special. It should give you significance. It should give you importance in your life. You should know that your life has a purpose. Just in and of the fact that we're created in His image. But you say, well, what do you mean by that? Created in His image and according to His nature. I want to talk about that a little bit and say that we have, a, we have a heart. We have a mind. And we have a spirit. Again, the animals, we can't contribute those things to the animal kingdom or to the animal world. The fact that we're, we're made in the image of God. And they, aren't, they don't have those things. They don't have those faculties. But we have those things. God gave us those things. He made us in His image uh, with the heart, the mind, and the spirit to serve and to worship Him. The heart, we're going to talk about the heart just a little bit. Psalm 145 verse 8 says this about, uh, about God and about love and about compassion. And I say this and I read this because it, all these things come from the heart. We're creating His image, man is, with a heart that's to be like God's. And it's, it's neat to me to think about the fact that in the very beginning, when God created man, as in that's where we're supposed to be, where we're at this morning, He was perfect. 
Everything God created was perfect before the fall. So think about it. He had the perfect heart. We're to have a heart that man created in us, like uh, God created in us, like Him, that's to be full of love and compassion. Psalm 145 verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. We have a heart. We've been given a heart like God's. Again, uh, Adam Clark says this about the heart. He says, This God can be pleased only with that which resembles Himself. Image, God, man, we're to, look, we're to look like God. We're created in His image. And God is pleased when we resemble Him with the things that come from our heart. He goes on to say, Therefore He must hate sin and sinfulness. He can delight in those only who are made partakers of His own divine nature. He says, As all creatures were made by Him, so all owe Him obedience and reverence. To be acceptable to this infinite spirit, the worship must be of a spiritual nature. It must spring from the heart through the influence of the Holy Spirit. So as we look at that, as, as we think about what the Scripture says about God being gracious and compassionate, the fact that we're made in His image and we've been given a heart, we need to ask ourselves, does our heart, do the things coming from our heart, are we given, the, are we given we're made in His image, are we reflecting His image to other people? He's given us a heart to do that. That's why He made us in His image. So we, we could reflect Him. We could resemble Him. That's what image means. A resemblance uh, of the one in whom we were created. So we may ask ourselves those questions. 1 John 4, 6, the Apostle John says this. He says, And so we know and rely on the love of God, uh, on the love God has for us. For God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in Him. This, is love overflowing from our heart to others? If it's not, it should be. And I say I. We're in this together. I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to myself. Scripture always talks to all of us. But we ask ourselves those questions. Made in His image. What a wonderful thing to think about. Are we reflecting? Are we resembling the heart of God? He's given us a heart to do that. A mind. We have a mind like God's in the fact that we're given a mind for a week that we can reason with and work things out. I tell you, I'm amazed at what man has been able to do and to accomplish. Even in the last 20, last 30 years, the things man has been able to accomplish. Now, when you put God in there and, and realize that you know God is behind all this, God is the one who gave man this mind to reason with and to accomplish all these things. It kind of helps you understand it. Amen? You guys awake? You with me? Okay. Think about it. The heart and then the mind, you know, they work together, but God's given a man a mind to reason and to think with. It's a beautiful passage from Isaiah. Isaiah 1.18, it says this. It says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They're, though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. He says, and the prophet says in the beginning, Come now, let us reason together. God gave us this mind so we can reason together. We can reason with Him. We can reason with one another. And again, in that way, we're different from all of God's other creation. We're made in, in, in His image. Adam Clark said this about it. He says, A mind like God's must be in truth not only in sincerity, but performed according to that divine revelation which He has given men of Himself, which would be His divine revelation would be God's Word. So we have a mind that we can reason with, we can read and we can understand God's Word, we can apply it to our lives, we can live it out in our daily lives, we can understand salvation. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6.17 tells us to take the heaven of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, without a mind, we wouldn't be able to do that. You haven't had a dog or a cat lately come up to you and share this plan of salvation with you, have you? Haven't had an ape to do that, have you? No, we're different. We're unique. We're created in His image. We're unlike any other thing that God created. We need to realize that. We need to understand it. So we've been given a heart and a mind. We've been given a soul and a spirit. I put those together. Uh, like God's, that is eternal which will live forever. I think, that's, I think this is another thing that we have a problem with sometimes maybe grasping the fact that we've been given a soul and a spirit that's going to live forever. 
It doesn't end at the grave like some people think. It is going to live on forever. In Genesis 2, 7, Scripture says this, and I love the way it puts it. It says, The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. A living being that is going to live forever and ever. We're never going to die. Isn't that great? Amen? You happy about that? We're never going to die? Especially if we know that we're, we're living for God. We know that we're eternally secure. Had an interesting conversation again uh, with a family member of mine this week. They said, wouldn't it be the coolest thing if you were born old and ugly and as you got older you got younger and prettier or better looking? Yeah, I said, that would be pretty cool. You know, it, it, it's hard for us to put our hands on. I said, well, God couldn't make it that way. I said, they said, well, why do you think it's, you know, why do you think we're like we are? Why do you think we're born like we are? Which some people are born looking like scrawny little birds, but why are we born like we uh, like we are? And then as we, you know, we get older and we get, you know, y'all, I didn't, wasn't saying y'all were ugly, I just applied it to myself as I get older, older, uh, what little bit of looks I had, they go away, you know, they, they leave you, but, uh, I said, I think God did that. This is just my speculation. I said, I think God did that to make us humble and to make us look more to Him and, more, and you know, rely more on Him. Because if we got younger and younger, we're more able, more able. You know, when you're young, you don't think, you don't have a tendency always to think about God like you do when you get older. But anyway, that was just a little side note in there. I thought I'd share that conversation with you. Listen to what Adam Clark says about having a soul and a spirit that is like God's, which is eternal. He says, a man worships God in spirit when under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He brings all his affections, he brings all his appetites and his desires to the throne of God, and he worships, worships him in truth when every purpose and every passion of his heart and when every act of his worship is guided and regulated by the Word of God. The enlightened part of mankind says Abdul Fazel, whoever that is, knows that true righteousness is an upright heart and believes that God can only be worshipped in holiness of spirit. We're created in the image of God with a heart, with a mind, and with a spirit. We're to be spiritually minded people. That's why God has given us these faculties, these organs, whatever you want to call them, God wants us to worship Him in spirit. He wants us to be spiritually minded people. God is a spirit. That's why He's given us a spirit so that we can worship Him in spirit and in truth. But just closing out on this first point is the fact that man uh, who was created by God is the only creation with a heart, mind, a soul, and a spirit. It's not true of any other uh, of God's creation. And this sets us apart as His creation is being different and unique from any other. And we don't take anything else away from that. You go away from here today knowing that you're different, that you're unique, that you're created in the image of God. Uh, what, what more do we need? What more should we need to encourage us and to lift us up and to give us something to live for than to know that we're created in the image of Almighty uh, and Eternal God who is going to reign and live forever and ever, hopefully. Uh, he is for sure, but hopefully we will with Him too. Second thing I want to talk to you about this morning is not only were we created in His image, but we were created for community. We were created for community. We're to be a community of believers. We've been created in His image with, for fellowship with Him. We've been created to have fellowship with one another to serve and worship God and to have fellowship with Him, to be a community. What a wonderful thing. Some things went on this morning before, before worship service, Sunday school, before anything ever started. Some people couldn't be here, different things going on, but guess what? Because of the community of believers that we have here this morning, everybody pitched in, everything came together, and it all worked out just, just fine because we here are... One, of the, uh, one part of the community of believers. God created us for such a thing, to be a community or a kingdom of believers. Jesus used the term kingdom, and I'm interchanging those two this morning for this point. Uh, not taking away from the kingdom, just kind of putting a different word on that. Jesus preached about the kingdom. 
Jesus taught the disciples to pray for the kingdom. He told us to seek the kingdom. He told parables about the kingdom. He gave Peter the keys to the kingdom and the kingdom was born on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls strong. There was a community of believers that were 3,000 souls strong. And I don't believe there's a better picture. Turn with me this morning to Acts or it should be up there. Uh, I guess this morning, Acts chapter 2. I don't believe there's a better picture or a more beautiful picture of a community of believers than we have in Acts chapter 2 after the church was born. The kingdom was born. The community was born. There's 3,000 souls strong on that day uh, than what we have in Acts chapter 2 verses 40 through 47. It says this about them. And I'm going to start in verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship. There's that word fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayer. You see all of those things going on here in this community we have at Eastern Pines. Look at verse 43. It says, Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miracles and signs were done by the apostles. But then key on verse 44, I think that's what you're seeing. It says, All the believers, that would be those of us who have made Jesus Lord and Savior, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Then it goes on to say they were selling their possessions and the goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad, sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people the Lord added to their number daily, those who were being saved. What a picture we have there of a community, of a fellowship of believers we have in the very beginning with the 3,000. We have that same thing going on here now. We gather this morning, as I gathered this morning with the men uh, to pray. Uh, one of the things that were mentioned were all the things that were going on. As you came in this morning to the church building, you're seeing things, you're seeing different doors, you're seeing new floors, you're seeing all these things going on. It's because we have a community of believers. People who believe in the same thing, who are wanting to accomplish the same purposes for God. Want to see souls brought to Him. And I think that's just the most wonderful thing. When we think about all that we're talking about this morning, the fact that we're made in His image to serve and to worship Him, how He gave us a mind and just all of these things. The fact that He wants us to be a community of believers. We've uh, started at the beginning with the series last week and we're going to continue that on. And just as we talk about all these things and, and just lay all those things out there, we never need to underscore the fact that this is why Jesus came for all of these things. All of these things took place and all of these things are happening because of Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. And we always need to keep that in focus. That the fact that we're able to have fellowship uh, with Him and with God is because of what Jesus has came and what Jesus has done. <coughs> the reason that we can have a community of believers here is because of Jesus and the fellowship we have with Him. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, he says, God who has called you into fellowship, talking to the church there uh, with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. God has called us into uh, to be a community of believers. He's called us into fellowship with Him. God is going to be faithful. He's going to be behind all the things that we do as a community of believers. You may be saying, well, what is, you know, I understand community. I understand believers. This word fellowship, I don't know how often that gets broke down. But fellowship is simply sharing and caring and nurturing. Working together with one another. Being willing to give what you have for another. Uh, kind of like we're going to do today for our youth uh, meal we're having today. That's going to be an act of fellowship that we're going to have. We're willing to go. We're willing to be together. We're willing to give. We're willing to see uh, things done and accomplished with the youth. That's, that's what fellowship is. It's about building associations and about building relationships. When I think about this this morning, I think about my grandmother. The fellowship that I have with my, with, uh, my grandmother. One of the greatest influences on my life. She shared a Bible with me that I used to take the teen Bible study when I was in high school. Uh, just always a godly figure for me and a godly example. And I had a relationship with her probably unlike any other. That's, that's what community is all about. It's about building relationships. I, I got uh, tickled at work uh, this week. Work night shift at FedEx Ground, have a radio because I move trailers and I heard the guys on the radio there. They're not exactly talking all the things that you hear us talking here at church. They're talking some different things sometimes. But somehow or another, the conversation came around to the Ten Commandments. And one of uh, Brandon said, he said, how many of you can say the Ten Commandments? And like there was dead silence on the radio. You didn't hear a thing. And then all of a sudden, you know, one would throw one out, another would throw one out, and they went on about it. And, uh, they never got them all. They got close. They never got them all. But anyway, 
went home that night, and uh, the next day I happened to be doing some filing, and I came across something that one of the kids had got in Sunday school. Guess what it was? It was a copy of the Ten Commandments. So I just, probably the next day, I take it and I give it to Derek. He said, look what I found. He said, what is it? And he saw it, and his face just lit up like, like a jack o lantern I mean, he just grinned. This is big. Got, got to see Derek. He's got uh, nothing wrong with big teeth, but he's just got a big, beautiful smile. He saw that thing and lit up, and he took it out to the workstation that afternoon. And that night before I got ready to leave, Brandon said, Mr. Johnny, I said, what is it? He said, come here, I've got something I want to show you. Brandon had taken the Ten Commandments and taken them up on the post at work. You say, well, why do you say that? I just say that because that's, it ties right into a community of believers. We take what we know, we take what we have, we take what we do, and we share it with the world. And we're having an influence as a community of believers here uh, for Christ. It's, a, it's just a wonderful thing. It's no wonder that the Apostle Paul said had this to say uh, in Philippians about fellowship and about this idea of community. It's a very powerful statement that he made in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. The Apostle Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings becoming like Him in His death. As we look at these things, as we hear the Apostle Paul talking about sharing and fellowship, uh, knowing uh, Christ, sharing in His fellowship, it, it takes us right back to where we started this morning about being in His image. We were created in His image. We were perfect in the very beginning. Man fell because of sin, but God has sent His Son back and given us His Holy Spirit so we can live and still be in looking and being in His image. We can reflect His image. Are we doing that? Are we doing that through this community of believers? You know, what are people going to go away today and say about the community of believers that they saw here at Eastern Pine? I hope and pray that they're going to go away encouraged, that they're going to go away excited, they're going to go away knowing that they're created in the image of God. It's going to be a wonderful thing. The last thing I want to speak to you about this morning is that we were created for eternity. Not only were we created in His image, not only were we created for a community, but we were created for eternity. Think about it. Again, we, you know, we're visually oriented people. You know, we see life and we see people's bodies die. And it's kind of hard for us to grasp that eternal, you know, that eternal part of our being, that uh, the way God has made us. Again, Genesis 2 7, you know, uh, God breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living being or a living soul. Uh, I like the way DJ put this. DJ says eternity has been placed in our hearts by our God. It's been placed in our hearts. You know, I think there's a hole, and I think this is a fact. No matter how you how you look at it, there's a hole in the heart of man and every man. Because God has placed eternity in the heart of man, there's a hole there that can only be filled by God. And God made us that way. Because He wanted us to reflect His image. He wanted us to be a part of His community. But He also wanted not only to have fellowship with us here while we were living, but to have fellowship as we leave here and as we live, live uh, life eternal. It's just a wonderful, wonderful picture. I want to share another passage with you. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57. The Apostle Paul understood this, I believe, as good as anybody. 65 times in the New Testament, eternal life is mentioned. But the Apostle Paul said this in 51 through 57. He says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. He says, In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, he says, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where all death is your victory, where all death is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, 
He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing to know this morning. If you believe that, say amen. amen. God's given us the victory through His Son. God has made us in His image. God has given us the opportunity to be a part of His community. And then God has made us for eternity. John 6, 51, the scripture, you're wondering when I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it right now. Listen to what, listen to what Jesus said in John 6, 51. He says, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Scripture goes on, on and on. It talks about eternal life. Then we get to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation in 21, 22. It gives us a glimpse of eternity. It gives us a glimpse of heaven. And in verse 7 of, of uh, chapter 21, it says, He who overcomes will inherit all this. I will be his God and he will be my son. And then in Revelation 22, verse 15, it says this. It's talking about being outside of the gates of the city of heaven. It says, outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Folks, it's as simple as this this morning. God wants a relationship with you, and He wants to spend it in eternity. So we asked ourselves just a couple of questions this morning about what we've heard. What kind of image do people see when they look at you and when they look at me? What kind do they see when they look at John Anderson? Am I a part of this community of believers this morning? Are you a part? These are valid questions that we should ask ourselves if we're concerned about being created in His image and about living for an eternity. That's the last question. Are we ready to face eternity? Or do we want to wait a little while longer? 2 Peter 3.9 says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come and to have eternal life. What's, what's, it, what's it with you this morning? How are things sitting with you this morning? It's only a question that you can answer. There's a program that uh, <clears throat> American Family Radio is doing right now. It says, every life is beautiful. If you haven't listened to some of it, I encourage you to do so. Wonderful stories on there about life, about birth, about life, about sons, about daughters, about mothers, about fathers, about life, and about relationships. And that's where this bring, all, brings all of us to this morning. It's where is your relationship with Jesus Christ? If you're here this morning, you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you can do so. In just a few minutes, we're going to have a song of invitation. We're going to give an opportunity for you to come. And believing in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, being willing to repent of your sins, confessing Him before man and not being ashamed of Him in any way, shape, or form. Going down into water, grave of baptism. I love the way Romans puts it. It says, if we're buried in the likeness of His death, then we'll be raised in the likeness of His resurrection. I love the way Scripture says that. And then, he who overcomes, as we just read, uh, uh, will, will inherit eternal life. I will be His God, and He will be my King. If you're here, you never uh, you want to change your membership, you're looking for a place to worship, and we'd love to have you. Simply do that by coming up, giving a good confession, uh, knowing that you're baptized into Christ, and you're living your life for Him, you've made Him Lord and Savior. We'd love to have you come and give a good confession and be a part of Eastern Pines. If you need to come and pray, we can do that with you. If you need to repent, you can do that there, and you can do that here. We're going to have the opportunity in just a minute, but before we do, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning. I do, and I know the church does, for having your word, Father, for giving us a mind that we can we can read and we can understand and we can know the message that is that you have for us. The message that we're created in your image. The message that you want us to be a part of this wonderful community, unlike any other. That's the community in the kingdom of God. And then, Father, know that you place eternity in our hearts that you've given us life eternal and that uh, you're there waiting for us now. You're here with us now. You're there. What a great and a wonderful and a mighty God you are. I just pray right now that you'll prick the hearts and minds of, of, of all of us. And Father, whatever it is in our life that we need to change, that we need to do different, 
that we need to make right with you, whether it's me or whether it's somebody else here. Father, I pray that as we have this invitation time, Father, I pray that that will happen, that that will take place. Whatever it is that we need to do, Father, move us to do so now. Let your Spirit move among us. Forgive us of our many sins. We ask all these things this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Won't you please?